Now, the third person I want to talk about is Kurt Schneider. And Kurt Schneider is responsible for what he called the first rank symptoms and are called Schneiderian first rank symptoms. And he stressed that these were not specific to schizophrenia and shouldn't be rigidly applied, but that they're useful for making the diagnosis of schizophrenia. So he also emphasized that some patients show no first rank symptoms, but schizophrenia is still the appropriate diagnosis. Um, and that the disorder could be diagnosed exclusively on the basis of second rank symptoms and an otherwise typical schizophrenia clinical uh, presentation. So to quickly go over the first rank symptoms, um, the first one is auditory hallucinations. And the type of auditory hallucinations that he said we see in schizophrenia are the type that take the form of a voice or voices repeating the subject's thoughts out loud. Also discussing the subject, discussing the patient or arguing about the patient and referring to them in the third person. Um, also discussing the patient's thoughts as or before they occur. And then also taking the form of a commentary on the subject's thoughts or behavior. And I think that knowing that these are the common ways that the auditory hallucinations present is helpful for distinguishing uh, when you think someone's malingering or feigning symptoms. So I'll ask them questions that aren't really consistent with our understanding of how auditory hallucinations present in a patient. So I'll ask them a question like, do you hear the voices significantly louder in your left ear? Or um, when you hear the voices, do you also see the words pop up in big bubbles over your head? And when a patient says yes to those questions, I have a higher suspicion that they're feigning symptoms. And the next first rank symptom is thought insertion. And that's the experience of intrusion of unusual ideas or thoughts into the patient's mind as a result of the action of some external agency. Um, so you'll hear things like microchip, someone put a microchip in my head and they're, they're putting the thoughts in there. The next is thought broadcasting. That's the experience that the subject's thinking is no longer confined within his own mind, but is shared or accessible to other people. So they think that other people are hearing the, their thoughts. The next is thought withdrawal. And that's the experience that someone else are removing the thoughts from your mind. The next is passivity experience. And that's the experience that actions, sensations, or bodily movements, or even emotions or thought processes are generated by something external to you. Um, and they're not as a result of the will of the person. So like one example that I've seen is people will think that their hand will move and that someone else is responsible for their hand moving. And then the last two are just primary delusions and delusional perception. So then some of the smaller players in schizophrenia. So Ernst Kreischmer, he believed that certain mental disorders, that people, those people had a particular body type. So he felt that people with schizophrenia were more likely to be have an aesthetic body type. It means like a slender muscle physique, like a more athletic body type. And that's in comparison to the body type that he felt that bipolar patients had. And for those types of patients, he felt they had a picnic, pic, picnic body type. And those are like short, stocky physiques. He definitely held some funny beliefs. Like he felt that people with a picnic body type were more friendly um, and thought that you can judge personality and mental disorders based on a person's body type, which is not really believed today. Um, and it sounds strange, but sometimes you do see some of this stuff. I don't know. Right, the next person is Carl Jaspers, and he played a major role in existential psychoanalysis. So he believed that schizophrenia might be related to a person's struggle with existential issues, like freedom, responsibility, and search for meaning, whereas secondary delusions were influenced by the patient's background or their situation or their mental state. And I do think that thinking psychodynamically does help us to understand um, a patient's delusions. An example of that is I can think of a patient that I had who had the delusion that they smelled really bad. And I think that's almost like a latching on of a negative self-esteem with a delusional thought process. So the belief that you smell really bad and that people are not attracted to you and want to go away from you almost latched on to the person's personality structure. He also distinguished between primary and secondary delusions. So primary delusions were delusions that happened with like no real apparent cause. So they were the more ridiculous ones. And then the last person I'm gonna talk about today is Adolf Meyer, and he was the founder of psychobiology. So he believed that schizophrenia was a product of complex interactions between genetics environment and the person's personal experiences. He was really the forerunner of the stress diathesis model. And that's that developing schizophrenia was the interaction between a person's underlying biological vulnerability 
uh, which another word for that is diathesis, and then environmental stressors. And I think this is really an important concept to understand because we even see uh, identical twins where one has schizophrenia and the other one doesn't. And this also helps us understand why someone can be loaded with schizophrenic genes and then also not go on to develop schizophrenia um, because they never had that major stressor that pushed them to developing it. And then on the flip side, someone can have a, a low genetic loading and then have a childhood that is, you know, conducive to developing schizophrenia and they can develop it.